Um, okay, I'm, I'm Mark Gosha, the trial cover, everyone calls me Gosha. I'm um, a PhD student, so this, uh, this, re uh, this is a research project, what I'm going to be presenting, and it's going to be very, very different. I just want to warn you to the previous presentations you've heard here yeah. today. Um, so it's a collaborative research project. Um, it's an arts and humanities research funded project. Uh, there's four of us, there's a CDA, so uh, it's four uh, PhDs doing their research on Ironbridge and looking from different perspectives. My angle is on world heritage and looking at the relationship between world heritage and uh, local communities and the concept of local communities. The other PhDs are uh, concerned with the um, tourism and world heritage, uh, education and world heritage and communication of industrial values. And we're going to combine this together and uh, have a bigger picture on understanding this relationship between the world heritage and those different um, um, topics. Um, but my PhD itself, uh, I'm an archaeologist, but this um, research is based on cultural anthropological uh, fieldwork and methodology. So I'm not going to be applying an archaeological uh, methodology here. It's, it's purely cultural anthropology. Um, but my background uh, is in policy as well. Um, when I stopped working as an archaeologist, I got a job as a heritage management specialist for the National Heritage Board of Poland, where, where I eventually became a head of the national, uh, the head of the heritage policy department. When I was actually dealing directly with the World Heritage Convention and its implementation. Um, so this PhD project is actually combining my previous experience as in, uh, someone who was working with the convention and its implementation and my interest in local communities because I, I did a public archaeology degree as well. Um, so the research is taking this, what I call it, a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach, which is uh, reviewing international policy, which I'm not going to be talking about today. So I um, analyzed all the uh, World Heritage Committee uh, decisions concerning communities. And I went into uh, ECOMOS archives and I looked at ECOMOS, ECROM and IC and archives and looked at the representations of communities there. And what I'm going to be talking about today is the Ironbridge Gorge World Heritage Site and my anthropological fieldwork and people's understandings of the site. That's what I'm going to be talk talking today. So that's my research uh, questions, my main question which I'm trying to address um, in my uh, fieldwork. And I didn't realize that it's going to be that difficult to actually identify your local community and, and kind of justify what is your local community. So this uh, I incorporated as one of, one of my first research questions, how you identify your local community, who is your local community, especially when, it, when a world heritage site is concerned. Um, my second research question is basically looking at the how people value the site and how this compares with the state of standard universal value. Um, and also I'm looking at the how different identities people have create dissonance in understanding what the World Heritage Site means and how this impacts into the transmission of the World Heritage OEV into future generations. Um, so the... Um, okay. So according to the convention, it's a duty of a state party to actually identify the properties within and the heritage within its territories. And it's, it's a duty of the state party as well to protect those properties and conserve and, and transmit the values of those properties into future generations. So it's up to the state parties and different governments to actually employ different mechanisms and uh, in place to actually engage and how they engage communities, it depends on the different um, governments and, and countries. Um, but the World Heritage Committee meetings, um, the flagship events of UNESCO, have, um, have very rigid, um, what I call it, um, structured rules in place which favours government expressions of views uh, rather than non-governmental or uh, individuals. Uh, so moreover, well, what I noticed as well when I was working on a nomination dossier is um, it is becoming increasingly um, challenging to actually, uh, to actually write up a nomination dossier and, um, and, it's, uh, and it's difficult and to fulfill those criteria for inscriptions. And some of you who worked on that, uh, on the compiling nominations will know that. And sometimes it's required for a state party to actually go outside and look for experts outside its, uh, its own country because there's no capacity within a country. So the, so the system itself is exclusive uh, in, um, when it comes to experts, never mind communities, you can imagine. So this highly specialized bureaucratic process, which rely on expert knowledge, 
and understanding of procedures can be seen out by the definition as exclusive, as I said. And um, so in this context, my overarching question is whether other values than those assigned by experts can be included in the concept of OEV, and whether this, um, this distinction exists at all, or maybe it's in our imagination. So this is, uh, in 2007, communities were added to the strategic objectives of the convention. At the beginning, uh, the, uh, the, when the convention was established, communities were not considered at all. Yes? So this is a very new phenomenon. Uh, communities were included in the 1992 in operational guidelines, and from then on, it's, uh, the, the, this topic progressed. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, it's been incorporated. But, um, okay, so now um, I'm going to be talking about my case study, which is uh, a, a World Heritage Site in Ironbridge. It's located in Shropshire. Um, and the area became, uh, that's the gauge. The gauge has been inscribed, uh, not just the gauge, but the area of... Uh, Made a little bit, I'll show you in the map just in a second. Um, the area became famous in the um, early 18th century, uh, especially when the um, production uh, t technique of smelting iron by using coal instead of charcoal was developed. And that's the place where the Industrial Revolution started. And um, in uh, late 19, uh, late 19th uh, century, the area became uh, uh, went into a gradual decline, and especially after the war, um, this, um, um, especially after the war, um, the area became depopulated, um, significantly depopulated, and the um, and the vast um, areas which were mined <coughs> were abandoned, and also they uh, posed a risk hazard; they couldn't be habit, uh, inhabited and they had to be redeveloped. In order to actually re re redevelop this vast industrial landscape, there had to be a, a case made uh, for, the, um, for the injection of, uh, of a large amount of money. And um, in, the, in the 60s, uh, a, a new town was designated in the area, and the Iron Bridge uh, and the Gorge within that new town was designated as an area of uh, um, special historic interest and special uh, amenity area, which could be served as a tourist attraction in future. And as part of this Telford Development Corporation, a trust was uh, set up in a 60, 1967. It's called the Iron Bridge Gorge Museum Trust, which was um, which looks after um, major monuments within the landscape. And the trust is uh, operating until now, and it's a self-funded entity which heavily relies on visitors' footfall. Um, and the trust looks after, as I said, the uh, the main areas, uh, main um, kind of uh, landmarks within the gorge. In 1986, the, um, the site has been nominated on the World Heritage List. That's been before the. Uh, cultural landscape has been introduced into uh, operational guidelines, so the site couldn't be described as a cultural landscape. Therefore, two monuments were um, single out, and one of them is the, uh, the fir uh, furnace and the iron bridge. Uh, so, the, so the blast furnace of Colbrook Day was built in 1709 as a remind, reminder of the discovery of coal. And the bridge at Iron Bridge was the first world uh, bridge constructed of iron and it had, co had a considerable influence on developments in the field of technology and architecture. Okay, that's the criteria under which the, um, the site has been described. It's criteria one and it's the bridge as well and the, and the furnace, again, cobalt dead blast furnace, uh, criteria two, criteria four, um, and criteria on six, which includes tourism, uh, uh, I think. So that's the extension of the site, and the, uh, as I said, that's the, the gorge itself, and the area of Maidley is also part of the World Heritage Site. I will be talking about Maidley today as well, uh, as um, some of my interviewees are from Maidley. Uh, there's a 4,000 people living within the World Heritage Site, and it, it consists of uh, settlements, Cobble Day, jo uh, Ironbridge, Jackfield, Colport, <coughs> Blisshill, and Maidley. Um, so, 
when it came to identification of communities, I found it really conflicting, as I said. Uh, who is my, uh, when I look at the literature and I look at the different community projects, uh, rarely they actually um, state a, a methodology how they identify their own communities. Rarely. It's, it's, so when I look into literature, how actually uh, communities are represented in the academic literature strictly, uh, they, there's, um, it, there's a confusing, um, there are confusing definitions. On one hand, communities are fluid, they're not self-referential, at the same, same, at the same um, time, communities will be referred as indigenous communities, descendant communities, uh, local communities, or archaeologists as self, self uh, uh, well-defined group. So there's a confusion within the literature I found uh, as regards to communities because on one hand the, the literature is saying communities are fluid, on the other hand there's a, a very well-defined group um, of communities like indigenous communities. Um, so defining local communities through local residents can be a limiting in scope, however I found that it was a, a good starting point and that's how I started uh, my fieldwork with a, with a concept of uh, locality. Um, and before I started my fieldwork, I was hoping to actually incorporate uh, like um, diversity of identities in, uh, people have uh, into my uh, kind of understanding what people think, and without dividing the communities into different groups. And what I learned very quickly is that people put themselves into different categories, different communities uh, themselves very quickly. So it wasn't me who actually was. Um, defining communities uh, itself, but then the self, they, 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 they define themselves. So I had three different groups of communities, and there were original communities, and uh, this, uh, people who uh, came to the 80s to when the new town uh, came into being, and they are uh, middle class of people who settled mostly in Ironbridge, Cobbledale, Jackville, and Coalport. Um, and we've got the descendant community who came forward, who actually travelled a long distance to contribute to the project uh, because they felt attached to the place. So I've got three different communities with very different relationship to, uh, to the uh, statement of our standing university fact. And so I carried out a survey. I've got 130 responses. It was, uh, in that, it was a quantitative and qualitative uh, data analysis. It, quantitative and qualitative kind of uh, survey, uh, looking for um, people's perception of uh, concepts which are included in the state of our universal value. So I was looking at what the site means to you, which is a categories uh, of inscription. Then I was looking at the concept of authenticity, integrity, and management. Um, and then I conducted around 45 interviews, uh, in-depth interviews, trying to understand what uh, kind of uh, in-depth, uh, what, what the server was telling me. Uh, and once again, I, was using, I wasn't using the stakeholder approach, I was using a cognitive approach, obviously, as, as a research, as a, um, um, okay. Um, so a cognitive approach, it means that I was looking at the different identities and relationships people have with the site. Uh, so, in my survey, I didn't ask any, uh, there were no prompts in my, in my uh, questions. I asked what this site means to you, put three different words which come into your mind. And I put those, and those words came, every single person said it's history, it's historic, it's historical, anything is called. Then identity and pride, as I said, there was no prompts, and then it's aesthetics and economy. Um, when it came to, uh, when I asked people to identify, okay, yep. I've worked as a system. When I asked people, um, what are the places of significance? Again, without any prompts, uh, bridge was only mentioned. I think um, the bridge, the Iron Bridge, which is, um, it was mentioned. Um, I think uh, Ironbridge, yeah, 17 responses only said, um, you can see the responses is very, really low in comparison to, uh, it's around 20 people, 20 people out of 130 said that, uh, mentioned the bridge, and even less people mentioned the furnace. Um, so that's uh, interesting, and that's, I, can, I put on a map uh, a number of responses, as I said, People had a blank survey, uh, and they had to put the, whatever came into their mind, what is important to them. And a Bliss Hill, 
Bliss Hill, which is a reconstructed uh, uh, Victorian village, is the most important place actually to people, and I'll tell you why later. <laughs> and uh, uh, and Ironbridge itself as a town for people from Ironbridge will be very important as well. But otherwise, as you can see, that's, uh, um, uh, that's the kind of uh, responses I got. Um, when I ask people uh, whether the, um, the, the site is... Uh, I, I, I had to explain to people, especially <coughs> in the what is UNESCO, what is World Heritage? They didn't know they lived within a World Heritage site. I was conducting this research in a place which was within the World Heritage Site, they didn't know that they are within the World Heritage Site. Uh, so when I was explaining what is the World Heritage Site, what it influences, obviously they don't think it influences their work because they don't even know that they are within the World Heritage Site. Uh, but uh, some people will say that they they appreciate the they appreciate yes, so the um, the designation influenced the way they appreciate the site, but quite a lot would say no. Uh, when I asked people whether the UNESCO designation affects their uh, life, uh, quite a lot of people said no as well, uh, which is 50%, uh, which is quite interesting as well. Uh, people who live in Ironbridge would tend to say yes, because they are affected directly by the planning regulation, and they would say this is probably because of UNESCO. Um, would you say that the Ironbridge Gorge gets better protection because of its international designation? Again, 79% uh, say yes, and it's not the case because it's, a, it's so it's a perception. It's, it's, it's all about perception. That's what I was looking at. Um, does it matter that the monuments of Ironbridge? This is a question which was trying to encapsulate the idea of integrity. I couldn't ask ever. Uh, is the original condition? Most people will say yes, but. Um, the reality when you actually, because as I said, I was conducting anthropological field where I was interviewing people in their houses and you see the reality is very different. When they start talking, they will um, negotiate this, uh, this kind of idea of uh, authenticity. They're sort of like, well, I want to put um, you know, solar panels on my, uh, on my roof and uh, I wouldn't want to live in a museum. Uh, the, mo me, me, the monument located in the Iron Bridge are testament to industrial revolution. Does it matter that all the monuments are kept and maintained? Yes, again. And do you feel that the uh, site is well managed? 60% would say yes as well. Okay, it's not thank you yet. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, okay. Uh, so, there's, uh, so this is, this is it. So, the, as I said, the, the, so there are. I was working with two major communities, so the descend, not the descending community, but the original community who was living within the boundaries of the site or outside the boundaries, and the newcoming community, the newcomers. And that's just to, that just to illustrate this, 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 you know, this, this difference in the way people value the site, I just want to give you two quotations from two different members of the community, which I think will sum up quite nicely um, this, this, the way they understand the site. And so this, um, so when I asked the former miner about what this place means as a World Heritage Site, him, he said, not in those words. He said, the place does, but not in those words, you see. It is Maidy or Ironbridge or Cobbledale, Dale. But all those places, that, that's how, with those places, that's how I associate with it. World Heritage Site is like a posh description of the area. I know where you're coming from, he said. I don't associate with that, do I? Yeah, describing the people, here, working on furnaces, pits and, fur and on the foundry. And all of that, there were pre-World Heritage Site. I cannot put them into the World Heritage Site. They didn't belong to the World Heritage Site. They worked in the pits and the foundries. We keep their identity and we talk about the World Heritage Site with them in it, but not in daytime. Because I talk about working people, I appreciate you going to university, and I appreciate that you what you're doing there, and I can see that, but I'm not part of that, do I? So this is, he said, this is a part of your life, you see. When I asked the former IT specialist, he moved into the uh, into Ironbridge um, in the 80s, he had a very different view. He said, Ironbridge is quite interesting in regards to sort of tension between the experts in the local community because so many people who live in Ironbridge are actually in covers rather than the original community who have experienced or whose parents would have experienced the gorge as it once was. So I imagine certainly myself and many of my incoming friends would have the same sort of views of heritage as possibly the experts. We would have been sued by the experts. We are an incoming local community. We don't have the deep roots in this place. I think folk who lived here 
all their lives, se second or third generation, would have value, value, I think, much more some of the digital structures of the place. Parts they used to go down, schools they used to be taught in, even the language, the pubs, all those sort of things would mean much more to them, whereas for incomers, it is just a pub, it's a school, it's a park. Whereas the stuff which is much more interesting to us is the stuff of national significance because it is the place where the Industrial Revolution started. So this is one, one of the most common things which came from this fieldwork is that, uh, from this interview, is that the original community is not engaging with the concept of Austin universal value uh, of Industrial Revolution as opposed to the new co incoming community. And the original community has a direct connection with these industries in, um, in the Gorge. And one of my informants mentioned his grandmother, who, used to, who would have been 156 today, probably. And, and she never had a gas light or electricity. And she lived in Bicandula. She was a painter at Corpot, China Wars, not a top, the top class painter, but an ordinary painter, working painter. And she, since uh, this interview was conducted in Bliss Hill, he pointed down to the road where his auntie would have walked up and down on the way to work and back home. And while he was doing it, he said, strange, there's something about me that wants to hang on to something. And this is what Byrne calls familiar uncles in the changing world. Certainly this hill for the original community is that uncle, is the changing world where person has not lost its links with the past because it is still in the living memory. He explains that the heritage people are basically different than real people that they talk about. <laughs> it is translated, he said, it's shame that <coughs> the old life is translated into something different. Sadly, this is that what happens. He reflects that they, uh, they almost tell fairy stories, that you get children to read at school. We actually didn't leave fairy stories, he said. So there is a clear dissonance in contemporary local community in Ireland. And this dissonance is linked to the identity of who we are, who we are not. And this impacts the way with the OUV is transmitted into future generations. Thank you very much. It's still a work in progress. Thank you. <laughs>